Hello and welcome. My name is Ashley and I'm delighted to be hosting our very first season of LearnSide Webcasts, a series all about educators helping educators. We've invited university educators to share stories about their own experiences and challenges, along with tips and tricks that you can use in your own teaching. Thank you so much for listening and I hope you enjoy. Hello and welcome to this episode of LearnSide Webcasts. Today we're talking about teaching large student cohorts and we're joined by Dr. Dino Spagnoli and Dr. Brian Mewis. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourselves, which university you're from and what you teach. Dino? Hi, I'm Dino Spagnoli. I am a lecturer, a senior lecturer in the School of Molecular Sciences at the University of Western Australia and I teach in all levels of the chemistry major and I'm also the coordinator of first year studies um, which involves um, the teaching and organisation of large first-year classes in chemistry and biochemistry. Hello, I'm Ryan. I work at the Manchester Metropolitan University in the UK. I teach largely in organic chemistry. Uh, I'm the laboratory techniques leader for year one, I'm also the MChem year leader for year four, and I teach in all five years of our course, which includes foundation as well. Brilliant, thank you. So welcome Rose and thank you so much for joining us. So as reported by Higher Education Statistics Agency, the number of students uh, enrolled in a course at a UK university has increased by approximately 16% between 2016 and 2021. So this means that a lot of educators are teaching larger cohorts of students than in previous years. And today's discussion is all about how educators can teach these large cohorts of students um, effectively. So let's dive into the questions. My first question is, uh, how would you describe your student cohort in terms of its size and any other important uh, demographics? Uh, Dino, would you like to kick us off? Yeah, thanks. So um, I'll concentrate on our first year cohort because that's where we have our large class sizes. Um, we have four units um, that run in our first year and the Class sizes will vary between um, 150 to about 500 students in a particular unit. And so this has been a, a common trend for a long time, um, ever since 20, I'd say 20, 2012, when I first came, there was definitely a lot of um, these large first year classes. And that seems to have been consistent uh, throughout. Um, the particular class sizes that we have um, I mean, everyone likes to say that they've got a di diverse range of students. Um, I think that we're getting more increasingly diverse as the trends in education, particularly in Australia, is changing. Um, we're finding that a lot less students, unfortunately, are going through to do year 12 subjects. We call them the ATAR subjects here, maybe equivalent to A-levels in the UK. Um, and so therefore, students are finding our, our are not going through that pathway. And so therefore we're having to adapt with the pathways that we offer students into university. And so in terms of our demographic, we still have a large proportion of school leavers, um, but that's ever decreasing. And we're finding a lot of students coming in and now having a few years out for whatever reasons, maybe they need to work, et cetera, and then coming back into higher education. And so we're seeing the there's a larger proportion um, in the mature age bracket. And mature age can be anything like from 20, which I don't consider mature age, but the universities do, uh, because they're just not the school leavers from from um, from like 17, 18 is our school leavers age here in, in Australia. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Ryan, same question to you. Okay, so uh, our class sizes aren't as big as 500. Uh, that's a really impressive number of students. Uh, so our first year is typically around about 100 to 120 students. And in terms of the diversity, which Dino mentioned a little bit there, I'm going to largely focus on the different kind of actual entry levels to the subject that some of the students have. So we have like the uh, advanced level, so A-level students, and we also have students that come through from the BTEC background as well. So that's a different kind of actual approach to coming into university education. And on top of that, we also have some of the students who have come through a foundation year route. So they've actually done a whole year at the university already, maybe at this institution or another institution, 
depending on their background. And typically our foundation year can be as many as 200, 250 students. So in that actually has its own difficulties associated with that because it's a very much a common foundation year for a multitude of different science related subjects. And that means you don't sometimes get the specialism that you want those students to have because it's a very broad background in terms of actually approaching the university and making sure they're in, actually embedded. That can actually be very helpful to some of the students because um, the first year students are not really all first year students. Some of them are actually technically in their second year at the university because they've already had that foundation year. And so they obviously at that point know how the university functions, how to actually navigate themselves around, where the labs are, et cetera. So that can actually prove to be quite useful. Uh, but the, the problems that we foresee actually is actually that background of actually where the students come from in terms of their education diversity, in terms of making sure that some of the students are challenged whilst actually also teaching to the actual level to bring up some of the students to the right level. And so that can actually have its own problems associated with that in terms of actually making sure everyone's challenged and supported at the same time, which is often quite hard in a large cohort. Thank you. Okay, so second question then. So um, how do you think being part of a larger class affects student experiences of learning? So I think we've briefly touched on that. Ryan, do you want to expand on that? Yeah, I think what I might do here is just actually pull out from one of the discussions I had with one of my personal two T's the other, the other week, where they said they're, they're all coming from a college background. And it said it's very hard when you're in a part of a large cohort where normally they had a chemistry lecturer or teacher who would actually come around and see how they're doing on a one-to-one -one basis every day. And they'd actually have that kind of very personal contact with them. And I think that's something that a lot of students miss is because when you're in a large cohort, although someone might be talking to the group, you are not talk you haven't got that kind of interpersonal connection with them. It isn't a conversation that's shared between two people. It's very often a conversation that's shared between one person and a large number of other people. So it's how about you break down that barrier to allow those students to feel like they are very much connected to that in one individual, but on a very, you know, on the same level as everyone else around them. So that there isn't actually any people being picked out for specialized treatment or the fact that certain people are very much more vocal than others. So they might be actually able to engage with them in front of other people. So it, it is quite hard in terms of actually managing. Yeah, I guess it's an expectation in terms of what the students want to have and actually what sometimes can be provided to them. And it's about how we can actually break down those barriers and allow those students to actually feel like they are connected to everything and the fact they are involved and therefore they're actually, they are getting something out of that session in terms of the fact that they feel a vested interest because they know the person who's running it actually wants them to be part of that uh, experience as well. Yeah, I think um, that uh, sense of belonging, Ryan, which I think you're uh, maybe alluding to is, 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 is a real challenge when you've got really big classes. Um, and I, I, I was thinking about this, uh, our cohorts and what they must go through, particularly those that are the school leavers that have their, their small class sizes. They've got a, um, a tutor or, or a teacher that they're very much know, and then they, they get thrown into a class size, which in some ways could be up to 500 in our case. And then you must imagine what, what that must be, be like for, for students. Um, it could be quite daunting. Um, and, but what I would say about the student experience is that I like to, well, from my, my own experience and having taught in these classes, um, we've got a situation where, and I'm not sure this is the same with you, Ryan, that we record all our lectures. So everything's recorded. And students will, will turn up to the first lecture because they know, but they think they have to. And then over time, you see a dramatic decrease in, in attendance in, in lectures. It's because they can get exactly the same content, um, or they think they can, from, um, from, from watching it at home or watching it um, offline uh, or online but uh, not in the lecture and so I do think that students can feel that it's quite daunting for them to come come into that large classes um, but then over the course of the semester they see that it dwindles uh, in terms of attendance and then you get 
um, quite it can be quite small class sizes. So, so we get we unfortunately we can get down to about twenty percent. So um, attending, so therefore you get a, a small cohort of students that always attend everything, and they always will. But some students decide not to, and I think that I don't think that you can blame technology on this solely as the sole problem. I think is that they've been thrust into a very foreign situation to them. And sometimes they would like to to revert back to being able to get that content, but in the comfort of their own home or without having to make the trip onto campus. Um, and so students are very much adjusting to to their own thought pro to, to how they want to learn and how they want to consume their, their knowledge, which uh, I think as educators we need to be aware of and to to um, think about how we develop our teaching strategies to 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 be, because of the the large class sizes and the the technology that students have available to them so can i just uh, pick up on those points so I, I completely agree with the fact that normally we do see a drop in attendance uh, as we go throughout the semester and i think that we also do record all of our sessions as well I think in the modern day age is the fact that a lot of our students actually do have a job alongside the education. Yeah. I think being able to actually access a learning resource whenever they want to, rather than actually having a proper timetable session, does allow them to actually kind of work around their work-based commitments as well. And particularly yes. a lot of our students do need to work, otherwise they can't do their education. And it's that horrible re- that cycle of basically needing to work to do an education, but sometimes they can't do the education because they're having to work. And it's that horrible yeah. cycle of going around like that. So if we can offer them the flexibility whereby they can actually catch up on a session that they can't attend or they have missed, and then actually they, they are on the same page as everyone else, so to speak, then that's really good from their uh, capacity. And they also feel like they are being supported. But I, mm. I always wonder about how they feel as part of a large community, which is often what you only get when you're on campus and you're, yes. you are basically mixing around with other people as well. Um, so I don't really know, well, how that can be transformed in the kind of digital age because we are tending to go more to a kind of digital technology in terms of how we actually approach our course design and how we deliver it. But I do think at the actual centre that there has to be the student community. They have to feel like they have to yeah. have that sense of belonging. And when you belong to somewhere, you feel like you can ask for support a lot easier than when you're actually a lot further away. Um, mm. Yeah, so I, I can see how uh, experiences uh, at your university and at mine, they do kind of interweave. There are kind of like a... There are certainly a lot of overlaps in terms of the student experience and what we see as actual education facilitators in terms of the student demographic and their attendance, mm. et cetera. So, so we, we talked about the student experiences. Perhaps this, is, perhaps this is a great opportunity to now talk about your experiences as, as teachers. So how... How do you find that having a large cohort affects your teaching experiences? Are there certain challenges that become more prevalent when teaching a, a large a class? For example, this, you know, trying to, to help students belong, feel like they belong somewhere is, is an example. Are there other, other big challenges that we're, we're looking at, Dino? Yeah, there, there certainly are challenges. I think, as Ryan mentioned, we, we do need to be aware that a lot of our students do have to work they they can't make it onto campus at the set time that we schedule the the lectures um and so this flexibility in their learning i think we've got to we've got to we've got to cater for really um and so the challenge is really stem back to to thinking that you've always going to have an online presence of your of your lecture and i'd say even those that attend the very good students will watch that your lecture again uh, because they can press pause on me they can rewind me they can speed me up if they're they're feeling particularly bored um and so having that awareness that there's always this online presence um that needs to be catered for will change your your strategies that you use you'll make sure that everything that you uh, write down is captured as well whether that's a your whiteboard being recorded by um a video camera or we've got these visualizers where you can make notes and that gets captured as well 
Um, so there, there's some some strategies that you that we use that I use. Um, I've also tried to include some interactivity into the the large classroom, and there I like using polling software. Polling software is one that I feel really does help students not wanting to put their hands up and give out the incorrect answer in front of their their, their fellow students. Um, and there's a variety of different packages that you can find now that would, would allow you to do these online polls. Um, because you try to encourage students to make mistakes in lectures, well, I do anyway, if, they, if they're going to, because it costs them nothing in terms of marks. Um, but whereas, um, but they don't like to look like that they don't know anything. So they really, especially, and I find that with, is is the issue with school leavers. They really don't want to stand out as much as um, when I teach to second and third years. They're a bit more comfortable in their own setting. They've made a few friends in the classroom, and they're more likely to have a conversation with you where they, they, they don't mind saying, I don't know. Um, um, at first year, it's really, really different. Students really don't want to um, feel like they, they don't know an answer. So that's um, some strategies that I've tried to introduce into the classroom. So I'll just pick up, uh, use one of Dino's examples there, of using like the software to poll the students. Uh, I don't know if you have a, a program or back in the 1990s, I think it was called uh, Ready, Steady, Cook, where they used to actually ask yes. the audience to vote for their uh, favourite chef, for like uh, red tomatoes and green peppers, I think it was. So, I've used a system whereby they just the students get some card. It's red or green, and it's either it's one or the other eight answers, just as like a formative assessment as we're going through. And in particular, if I can see that uh, the response is nowhere near what I want it to be, then I can actually go back and revisit that concept and make sure it's actually embedded the second time around. So uh, you can obviously use other platforms like Kahoot and maybe Padlet. Mm -hmm. uh, Padlet's quite a nice one for actually uh utilizing where you've got like kind of like a free text answer or a uh, near pod is another one but i think sometimes it's the technology is very good but uh, sometimes if it doesn't work then having like some card around is actually quite useful as well uh, just as a backup uh, but i have used other ones i just mentioned as well that they all have their actual times and uses i think and yeah I think the reason for me for actually wanting to actually see how the students are doing is because I think when you're taking them through like a whole of actual conceptual basis for a whole unit, it's very much like telling a story. And if the students don't understand the beginning, they won't understand the middle and the end because you need those kind of foundations in order to actually draw upon as you go through that unit. And I think part of the actual student's experience and part of my experience as well at teaching is is seeing that kind of actually looking into the actual eyes of the students and seeing, are they actually understanding me? Can I actually, have I actually taken along that journey and are they actually with me on that journey? And it is very much a case of when you're looking into a hundred sets of eyes that you can't possibly kind of look at all of them. Otherwise you're going to spend most of your time looking around the room and you kind of get very distracted. So it is kind of a case of you pick up on a few people in that kind of room, uh, maybe five to 10 is what I do. Um, mm -hmm. It's from a very famous DJ, actually, uh, when he goes to uh, big concerts for like tens of thousands of people. Uh, when they put another track on, he likes to see how it affects maybe five or six people in the crowd to see if it's actually a good track or it's a, a not very good track. So I'm kind of using that same, same approach here uh, just to see what kind of visual cues I actually have from the students because normally if someone's not actually following something, their demeanor changes in their face. They don't look particularly happy anymore or they kind of have that really exacerbated look on their face to say, what on earth is he going on about? So at that point, I can also use that as a very visual pickup to actually go back and uh, do something again. And I think, Dean, I mentioned something that's very important in terms of our students, uh, again, is the fact they don't like to answer things in front of other people because genuinely, if they get something wrong, it's remembered by everyone else around them as being wrong. So sometimes it's, if you ask the question, what do you think about this? It's a very opinionated question. Then that means they can never be wrong. 
uh, because they're offering an opinion. And I think that's a nice way of trying to kind of broach that barrier uh, mm-hmm. to allow them to actually explore that space and do it in a safe way because they can't be wrong. And that can really help boost their confidence. Uh, also, they get them into all the like small groups and get like spokespeople to actually report back. So they're actually expressing the, the views of more than one person. That's another kind of way to do it. So anything really whereby, in terms of my own experience of what, you know that teaching session is, I want that kind of connectivity. I want to see what the students are actually under, what they understand and what they're actually struggling with because. My role is really there as an education facilitator. And if I'm not doing that right, then I'm letting them down. So mm-hmm. it's any way I can actually kind of get that very c- continuous feedback. Uh, I guess really on my performance, then I can actually try and fill those gaps in as we go along. Fantastic. Well, I think you've, you've kind of answered my last question. And I was going to ask for some tips and tricks uh, of, of what you would suggest. So I think we've covered a lot of different things there. So that's that's fantastic. Um, OK, do you have any questions for each other uh, around this topic at all? I've got a question for Dino. Uh, sure. Do you do lab laboratory classes on the same size? Yes. Yes, we do. Yeah, they all do a lab that's in smaller smaller groups obviously yeah so our labs so are, when, yeah we would have i was just about to ask you what the what a small size might be for a lab because i was trying to see if that stacks up against what i think is a small size for a lab uh yeah the the class size we we get to or well, the maximum we'd get to in a lab at first year is 36 in a lab um and in second year it's 24 second year and third year is 24 in a lab yeah and well given the fact we've been talking about large cohorts and if you've got 500 students imagine it's quite a big mental task for you to know all the students by name Whereas when you've got a lab class of 36, you probably do know them all by name very easily because you've got that kind of repetition. Yeah. You see them yeah. quite a lot. Um, yeah. Do you often find that actually having them as a smaller class and then going into a larger cohort means that you can actually use their names sometimes and actually have that kind of much more personal connectivity with them rather than saying, you, fifth person from the back row, second yes. one in. Oh, you know, certainly, yeah. Thing. One of one of the so, best things we we actually introduced into our labs was was name badges, um, so that students would put their name down and the demonstrators and the staff would put their name down, and they'd be shocked when I'd call them by their first name and they're like, "How do you know that?" and they forget they've got a name badge on on them. Um, so, but then you're absolutely right when you're in the larger classroom when you go back to the lecture theatre and you can you can ask someone directly or they speak to you and you call them back by their first name. It really does help. It really does help um, build that rapport with, with them. And then other students get to see that sense of belonging as well. So, yeah. I, I mean, we've done a similar thing where we got them to write their names on the lab code, but we didn't have a, we actually got them to write it with a Sharpie pen. So they could do right. it very stylized or wherever they wanted but I think that the students do generally get surprised when you can, you know, remember their name outside the laboratory class when they haven't got a lab coat on with a big name on it. Yes. And yes. they always, they're very shocked and they always say basically, oh, I'm really surprised you know my name because there's quite a lot of us. And they say, well, if you've taken the time to learn my name, then I should learn yours. And there's kind of that, them, that mutual level of respect. And mm, I think that definitely. kind of helps them then kind of want to strike up a conversation they don't want to just basically come and ask you i don't understand this they want to actually engage with you on other levels as well and i think that's yeah it kind of helps that really you know you we've mentioned it quite a lot today about that sense of belonging and that's what i think we want all of our students to have is that, that sense of community the fact that they are very much part of it and we are part of what uh, that kind of experience for them as well yes i think it's uh that's totally right because I mean, I well, talking for the I, we can't talk for all of our colleagues, but majority of the colleagues that teach in our discipline, I think we're both from the chemistry discipline. We really want students to to come along and have a have a good learning experience and to learn something because we're very passionate about our subject. Um, 
So I think they can be, get quite taken aback when, like you say, that you do take that interest in them and then um, they, they, they can't believe that. So um, what I find quite funny is that now I've started teaching into second year, which is smaller class sizes. Um, they all know my name and I'm, I'm really struggling to know all of their names in the first lecture. And so I really make an effort to make, when I do have those small class group sizes to, to make, to get to know their names very, very quickly. Um, so that's been, that's been really good to, to do. Um, yeah, the, the sense of belonging is a, a really tricky issue. And I, I can't, I know that there's ways of doing that in an online environment, but I just don't think it's the same as having that on campus face to face experience with, um, with colleagues. I think we'd be having a totally different conversation if we were speaking from the, the same room as, as opposed to being on webcams. Um, it's yeah. just a different, a different way of communicating with people. I think that's a very important perspective as well is the fact that I imagine over the last couple of years, we've done quite a lot of online teaching and sometimes it's almost like being teaching into the abyss. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. kind of like uh, connectivity, the kind of establishment of a conversation with any of our kind of students has been very few and far between. I've tried a lot of different methods and it's almost like, I could ask a question. I could probably sit there for half an hour until someone would actually respond to me. And it's, it's it felt very one sided and very disconnected. So I imagine yeah. for the students, it would have been, it felt very disconnected, even to a greater extent, because they were trying to actually mm. learn the material as well. On top of that, so from my perspective, having that face to face contact uh, not only makes me feel a lot better about the actual scenario, but I, I think I actually do crave the connectivity as well. It's not just the students mm-hmm. wanting, I think it's me as well. And I think, uh, I wouldn't want to say this, but I think it improves my performance if I feel like I actually belong somewhere as well. And I think that's yeah. actually, it's, I think it's a 360 approach. Uh, Brilliant. Well, thank you. Thank you to both of you. I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, thank you so much for joining the conversation and providing your kind of insights and your tips and tricks for, for fellow educators with large uh, student cohorts. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. So thanks for listening. We'll see you all next time. Um, and in the meantime, we'd love to hear your thoughts. So please do uh, tweet us at LearnSciHQ with any comments on today's episode or anything you'd like to hear from us in the future. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye.